is really uh, an aspect of remembering. It's an aspect of growth and remembering who we really are. So, so they think about them in a different way. But that's really my journey into uh, the health world. Um, and, and the reason that we filmed the Human Longevity Project film series, went around the world, spoke with people in their 90s and 100s, um, was to get a, is to produce some content that... Jason Prawl, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm excited to talk about one of my my favorite subject matter. Yeah, we're going to talk about psychedelics. We're going to talk about how psychedelics can be used for a vehicle for healing. And I think it's interesting. We were just chatting in the pre-chat how you know the West and the East and some of these indigenous cultures, the differences in terms of our philosoph philosophical constructs and um, schemas around health and healing, and how that really informs how we actually treat uh, or or you know modify interventions for helping someone heal. So I think that we're going to have a really great conversation. We'll talk some of the science uh, around psychedelics, and then I would love to be able to focus with you in terms of some of the neuro-spiritual, emotional healing that can, um, that can take place with, uh, with their use. And they're, they're such a, it's such a popular topic now. I think in 2020 in particular, it's been up, like, it's just something that we continue to hear more and more about. And I know I'll do more and more podcasts about it. My own personal interest uh, in psychedelics for my own, my own journey and my own healing has been uh, profound. And I think it's, it's a great topic to be having on the, on the pod. I, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, thank God we're having these conversations now. I mean, for, for the longest time, it was taboo to even talk about this, right? If you were a professional, if you were in the field of science, and if you were a doctor, you know, how dare you talk about these things and, and hold them with any reverence or, or respect or curiosity. So um, if nothing else, let's have these conversations. Yeah. So before, before we tuck into it, I would love for my listeners yeah. to have an understanding of your work and your background. So, you know, you have done some seminal work, uh, particularly in filmmaking, the longevity project in particular was one of my favorites. Um, but how, why are you interested in some of the different verticals of healing in, in psychedelics and how did you kind of fall into this line of work? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, the brief overview. And it started when I was sort of 13 and had my own health issues, uh, namely chronic knee pain that, that doctors really couldn't get to the bottom of. And that, that stuck with me for 20 plus years. Um, and then I had some other health issues, skin conditions and these type of things that, that just nagged me and bugged me that, uh, chronically that I couldn't get solutions from the medical system. So that propelled me to really researching and digging up these things on my own. And this was back when the internet was um, very slow, dial up, web crawler. Yahoo. Um, I you know, think you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was annoying. It was loud. It was, it was, and there wasn't a lot out there, you know, so it was, it was difficult to, to sort of stumble across these things, but, but nevertheless, that was my outlet. And so as I began to understand some of these things, as I began to understand how much fraudulent information was out there and is being propagated in the health sphere, um, it really gave me some inspiration to help educate, inform, others. And ultimately that led to me sort of stepping into a practitioner role. I left my job in, in mechanical engineering and decided to start my own business, you know, basically doing health consulting, working as a sort of functional medicine, functional integrative practitioner. And I was working with people with autism, uh, 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 autoimmune conditions, cancers, uh, a little bit on the autism spectrum actually, but it wasn't a primary thing. Um, you name it, digestive issues, skin conditions, the, the standard things, thyroid issues um, that we're seeing now. And, and as I was doing that, right, that's really where I learned the most about health is working with people, a variety of conditions, a variety of, of individuals, a variety of circumstances. And in that experience, I, I got to hone my craft. I get to really see what was working, what wasn't working. And, and ultimately that led me to understanding that health as a, as a paradigm is really a lifestyle aspect. It's, it's really about the environment and about the lifestyle. And when I say environment, what I mean is the psychological environment, the emotional environment, the physical environment, right? So it's the internal environment. It's, it's an environmental thing. So you look at the environment. Um, there's nothing wrong with the body. There's nothing wrong with your genes. There's nothing wrong. Um, it is simply a matter of how you are interacting with your environment. And the other aspect um, to, to that, that sort of lifestyle environment equation that really um, 
came into fruition for me was trauma, right? So it's childhood developmental trauma and tra uh, trauma in adulthood, um, even intergenerational trauma, trauma that you inherit from your parents and grandparents. Um, the research is actually showing this is, this is, uh, this is the case now. So it's, it's no longer sort of in the woo-woo science anymore. Um, and th it's this trauma piece that really sparked my interest into sort of the psychedelic world as a means of therapy. And uh, I, I first read about ayahuasca maybe <clears throat> probably 15 years ago and or 12 years ago, something like that. And immediately when I read about it, I'm like, oh, this is cool. I don't know, you know, this was, this was before it was a very commonly uh, discussed thing. There wasn't uh, retreats all over the place like there is now. So it was a little bit difficult. Like you had to, I didn't know how to find the right shaman or, or a tribe or uh, any kind of lineage to, to step into. So, um, but it sparked my interest way back then. And then as I began to understand about trauma and how that's affecting us as adults, um, that, that really uh, prompted me to really look into this uh, directly through experience from, a, from the lens of a practitioner, uh, both a practitioner for other people and as a practitioner for myself, because there's lots of healing um, as we would call it, that, that I continue to need to do, right? Not only on the physical level and the emotional, spiritual, um, uh, mental level, there's all kinds of, of quote unquote healing. And I, and I sort of say that in quotes because in a lot of the indigenous cultures, they don't really think about this stuff as, as in terms of healing or sickness. Um, they kind of do, uh, but, but it's the, the use of psychoactive plants, master plants, plant medicines is really uh, an aspect of remembering. It's an aspect of growth and remembering who we really are. So, so they think about them in a different way, but that's really my journey into uh, the health world. Um, and, and the reason that we filmed the Human Longevity Project film series, went around the world, spoke with people in their 90s and 100s, um, was to get a, is to produce some content that came directly from the horse's mouth about what it is that really leads to a healthy and long life and why that might even be important. And so we took a historical look at the, the lifestyle, the habits, the mentalities, et cetera, um, the diets, of course, all that stuff, and really what it is that, that led people to being happy and healthy as they, as they grew older. Right. And what I, what I think is so interesting as I'm, as I'm hearing you talk about the remembering and this very different paradigm in which these cultures work in is when we, when we compare and contrast that to the allopathic model, mm -hmm. we were just talking about this in, in the pre-chat is that we tend to look at a person very mechanistically, right? So, oh, you have a problem with your, you know, blood pressure. Let me give you something uh, that's going to regulate your blood pressure. And we think that we can just take blood pressure. Like if you look at a very complex spider web, you just think you can take this one little piece of the spider web and affect it without actually affecting the whole person. And I, I think there's, to some extent, I think there's a lot of hubris around that, that we think that we can just oh, absolutely. Take, out, take out the piece of the car, fix it up, put it back in. And it's not, and that's how humans are when, and, you know, as a chiropractor, I've always been taught that yes, there's mechanist, there's pathways and there's, there's this mechanistic way that some things work, but there's also a vitalism. There's also that this, the sum of the person is more Am I going to say this right? That it's more than the sum of our a human, a live human being is more than the sum of their parts. Like if I was, and one of my mentors, um, I'll just name drop Dr. Patrick Gentempo, who's just been like such a huge influence in my thinking. I remember going to a retreat with him once and he said something along the lines of, you know, if I'm here right now, there is an innate intelligence that is driving, you know, my posture, my muscle tone, that's digesting my lunch, you know, all, all the things. And if I were to die in the next five minutes, the same pieces, like the same parts are still going to be there, but there's a fundamental difference between the two, right? So there's this, there's this sum, you know, when we think about mechanistic health, it's like, well, the sum is just equal to the whole and, you know, chiropractors, and I know uh, functional medicine providers, naturopaths, uh, maybe think people you might classify as alternative tend to look at the body as not just a whole, not even just holistic, but greater than the sum um, of your parts. And I, and I think it's an interesting paradigm shift for people to begin to consider because when we think about illness in the West, it is just that 
there's something wrong with you physically. Well, we just got to do something about your physical health. When we know, and I would say that at a rate of 100% of the time when I was in physical practice um, uh, with my patients, that emotion, there was always an emotional underlying component, like 100% of the time. I don't care if it was just knee pain. I don't care if it was shoulder pain, neck pain, whatever it was. There's something under there where you were emotionally or spiritually sick before the physical manifestation uh, showed itself up. Is that, is that very similar or in line with what some of the uh, maybe indigenous cultures or non-Western uh, views on healthcare have? Or yeah. Have- I, yeah. I think it's, it is. Um, there's, there's a lot of nuance, right? Once you really get into what we're talking about here yeah. um, at the, at the fundamental root, I think what I've, you know, and currently we're working on a film series, unfortunately we got paused for the past nine months because of, of the world being shut down in 2020, but um, we've, we went to the Himalayas in, the, in Nepal um, mm-hmm. to work with some of the Buddhist and bone healers. Um, we went to uh, India to work with Dr. Vasant Lad, and who's an Ayurvedic master. Um, we went into Peru to work with shamans, and we're scheduled to go to um, uh, New Zealand to work with the Maori and uh, to work with another shaman in, in um, uh, I'm totally blanking. We're Columbia. Um, and, and what, what, what we identified, what I identified really amongst those traditions and, and amongst some other traditions is that what we call illness or sickness or disease or, or the appearance of symptoms is really just stuck energy, right? It's, it's really the lack of flow and the lack of coherence in the body or mind or, you know, and, and when I say the body, I don't just mean this physical gross body that you can touch. I mean, the subtle body, right? There's, there's energetic layers. And even there, um, things can get stuck, right? So it's simply just a matter of where things are getting stuck. They talk about this in Chinese medicine um, and, and of course Ayurveda as well, that we're holding on to energies, emotions, what have you, in certain organs, in certain systems, and they're just getting stuck. They're getting trapped. And so the question is, is um, if that's true, and, and I happen to believe that it is based on my experience with some of this stuff, um, that how, why is it stuck and, and how do we facilitate flow? And how do we, so it's, it's really just the metabolism of this energy so that we're continuing to flow through, right? And so um, that's really all we're talking about. And we can call it sickness, we can call it disease, um, we can call it whatever we want, um, but, but it seems to be that it's just um, an absence of flow, um, of, of vital force, of energy. And so that's really it. And so again, it, we, can, we can complicate the heck out of it from there. Um, but if we, if we stick to that premise now, in terms of solutions, in terms of um, finding a cure, so to speak, the door then is wide open, right? We're not talking about just pharmaceutical medications. We're not talking about just herbs. Uh, we're not talking about any one modality in particular. We're now open to all kinds of energy medicine. We're, we're Qigong, uh, I, um, yoga. Uh, breath work, uh, all kinds of pranayamas, right? We can do uh, simple physical exercise and get things moving. Uh, we, we can do meditation. We can do sleep, right? Sleep's a fantastic healer. Um, <laughs> you got to right? do it. You got to do it anyway. You might as well do it well. Yeah. <laughs> but, but acupuncture and yeah. a scraping, and there's so many modalities that then open up when you think about this in a different way. And not to mention the things like the plant medicines, the master plants. And, and by the way, when we talk about plant medicines here in the West, we, we're, t- we're typically talking about the ayahuascas, the wachuma or San Pedro cactus, talking about peyote cactus. Uh, we talk about mushrooms, magic mushrooms. And then of course we have sort of the synthetically derived things like MDMA and, and LSD and ketamine and, and this whole host of, of other products, right? Um, but the, the master plants or plant medicines go beyond just the psychedelic hallucinogenic uh, plants that I just mentioned. There's also things like tobacco, a huge master plant in, in South and Central America. Probably, I mean, it's, if they, it's one of the grandfather plants. It's one of the big, big master plants that they work with. And there's hundreds of other uh, of medicinal plants and, and selective master plants. So um, it's not just the psychedelic, the hallucinogenic aspects of some of these plants. They are, it's much more rich of a history and tradition that is full of nuance. Um, and, and we're just scratching the surface here in the West. And so how do we, how do we get so, so, you know, my question here is, and I'm trying to come from, 
um, the, the listener's perspective, someone who may have never experienced psychedelics or who doesn't quite understand this paradigm or the schema mm-hmm. in terms of how they're thinking, how does somebody let's maybe define for someone, how do we get emotionally sick or spiritually sick or how we might, you know, what we might say, mental, mental, mental illness, like the depression, the anxiety, the angst, and then some of the more severe, you know, the PTSD and, and some of the more severe things that we have qualified on, uh, on this medical spectrum. How do we, how do we get there in the first place? Uh, well, it starts with being conceived. Um, and that's just the raw truth. As soon as we're conceived, we bring in, uh, at least from my perspective and and many other perspectives, we bring in sort of past stuff, right? And this can be karmic. We can call it past life. We can call it whatever we want, but it's, it's things that, that we have experienced previous to this life that are, that are unresolved, right? So that, that they're learning lessons when you're saying it's like as a, as a being, yeah. As a, as a complex being even bigger than a soul, your essence, the, 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 the thing that you really are, which is, which is pure awareness, right? But, but that soul container, that aspect of you comes in with, with things that are, that are unfinished or that have not been dealt with yet, that, that, you, that you're either meant to experience in this life or carry all this all the way through. But that's, that's step one. Now, even if we don't believe in that, that's okay. You know, we, we don't have to start there. The first traumatic experience, at least, is the birth, birth itself, right? We're probably experiencing a bunch of traumatic effects in the womb. Um, it's hard to deny that that's, that's the case, almost for sure. Um, but at the going through the birth canal itself is traumatic, right? Um, and we're coming into this world um, in a very difficult way, right? We go from warm, wet, comfortable environment just through this pressurized channel, right? And then and then out out the other side where it's cold and it's dry. And so and maybe someone's yanking on your head and there's exactly like slapping metal you. force up and trying to right, right. So so we can deny that the reality that 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 traumatic experience is because we don't remember it. But just because we don't remember it cognitively, um, at least we're not cap- if we're not capable of remembering it in our cognitive state as an adult, doesn't mean it wasn't traumatic. Um, but that's the first experience. And then as we um, go through our childhood, it's a, it, we're full of traumas. And when I say traumas, I mean, we are disappointed. We are left to cry when we're hungry. We're not fed instantaneously, right? So there's all these little micro things throughout the day that a little tiny being with very little emotional, capa- emotional intelligence and capacity to deal with that, that event starts to get overwhelmed. And you know this because babies cry all the time, right? And that is them telling you, hey, something's wrong, right? Like I've got stuff in my diaper that needs to be changed. There's a million things. I mean, I have a one-year-old and, and constantly he's, he's throwing a fit. No matter how much I want to try to protect him from any traumatic experience, it's not possible. So we go through our childhood with a, a ton of these things. And of course, as parents, we have only the limited capacity that we that we come with that we have developed at this point to be able to soothe and and comfort a child and this goes beyond just the physical aspects of feeding and and nursing and and holding and these type of things it, it is energetic so if i'm feeling stressed and overwhelmed and what have you because i lost my job and uh, the garage just burnt down i mean you name it anything that i'm going to be stressed about i'm giving off energetically the baby is because its its brain is in a state, it is almost pure receptivity. It is just so open to the environment that it is just literally drinking in the energy. Um, and that is the, the brainwave state that, that a child is in. It's almost unconscious, right? It's so little consciousness. It's actually the level of consciousness and the level of brain state that, that advanced meditators and monks kind of get to. Um, so once we unpeel all the layers of the onion, we kind of get back to that. We get back to that, that core essence, right. That's so open. And so because it's so open to the environment, um, it's constantly getting assaulted with emotional things. Like I said, disappointments, um, mom or dad leaving and the child not knowing where he or she is. There's a million things, right. And this happens, uh, really up through into adulthood. Um, but, but really, really affects us between the ages of essentially uh, conception and seven years old. And that is where we lay down a lot of our psychological frameworks, the constructs, the ego constructs, these patterns, these, these mechanisms of behavior that allow us to cope with, with the world that we're in. So um, for somebody that, that didn't get 
um, love just because they're there. Perhaps they, they got love when they did things correctly. Now, this person, because it's a brilliant uh, small being, is going to adapt their behavior to do things right, to clean things up, to, to accomplish things, whatever it is, to get that love and adoration because it, it has needs that need to be met. So we have all these psychological constructs that, that we then build in order to keep us safe in this world. Sometimes it might mean that we're silly and goofy. Sometimes it might mean that we, we develop a personality that is structured and very organized. Um, or um, uh, self-starter and somebody that, that accomplishes things and that really achieves. I'm thinking There's the a, overachiever that's always working until their eyes bleed, right? Because they're trying classic. to get that external validation from. Yeah, and, and that was a pattern that was laid down in our youth. Right. When it was, it, it's a strategy to get needs met, right? It's brilliant. And we have dozens and dozens of these. We don't just have the ones I mentioned. There's layers and layers and they're very complex behavioral um, sort of ego parts that we that we construct. Now those continue uh, into our adulthood, and they 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 lay down the the pattern that we continue to operate from as an adult. And these usually at some point become maladaptive. They're very very brilliant in one way, and yet very maladaptive in another way. So the nervous system can skew towards um, you know, stress, and this is very very well studied in, in a lot of the trauma research. Um, but that's essentially how we start to develop trauma. And, and, and again, parents divorced, alcoholic parents, um, imprisoned parents, um, of course, death, uh, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, neglect. Um, uh, and those can siblings. also just be perceived as well. Like, you know, but, I had to- well, It's, it's 100% perceived. Uh, yeah, because yeah. you're right. So please continue, but I want to say it's 100% perceived. Yeah, no, all I was going to add there is it could be, you know, mom didn't breastfeed you as quickly as you wanted. And that could be your interpretation of trauma or abandonment or rejection, even though mom was just like, you know, trying to get the, you know, trying to get herself to the chair, trying to get the pillow ready and whatever. And then she wasn't able to get it in the, in the time that you thought it was going to be appropriate as a young uh, being. And then that's, and I, I, I mentioned that just because I, I had uh, Dr. Nicole LaPera on the podcast and we were talking about broadening the definition of trauma because so many times yes. women will say, well, I wasn't sexually abused or I didn't have an alcoholic father or I didn't, you know, I didn't have some of these big T traumas that we tend to classify. And I love Nicole's framework because it's just what you were saying. It's the, you know, maybe it's that you didn't get the love in the way that you needed at the time that you wanted it. And that was this, you know, very, uh, very complex, uh, you know, uh, that sort of started the cascade of this complex construct where we begin to say, okay, well, I have to act a certain way in order to get what I want. And then these egos and ids and everything um, uh, develop from that. Well, well, and, and, and the breastfeeding example is a perfect one because even if um, some, some mothers are unable to breastfeed, right? So, so right there, they're trying, they're doing everything they can. And yet the baby's perceiving um, something completely different, or Correct. you're able to breastfeed and perhaps um, the milk for whatever reason, isn't nourishing enough, right? There isn't enough or it doesn't contain enough fat, whatever it is, the baby never feels quite nourished or full. So there's a sense of lack, right? So these things are energetic, they're subtle and, and it is 100% perception. So this is, this is why I say that no matter what you do as a parent, it, there's going to be residual sort of trauma, these little micro traumas that, that get laid down because you're, you're talking about the perception of the child and every child has a different perception because they're different, they're, they're unique beings. Right. Um, but, but they are so hypersensitive to the environment because they, they, they need to survive. Right. So, so that's, that's really what it comes down to. And, and that's why as a parent, you do the best you can. You realize that you're going to traumatize them. Um, so giving up this idea of the ideal parent, both as a parent and as a child, right. Um, is important. And so they're going to be traumatized as a result of being born. And so your, your role is, is to try to minimize that as best you can and also accept that that's part of life. And the beautiful part of that is that these traumas, you want to call them that, these constructs that we develop as a result of these sort of micro traumas or, or major traumas, they are the skills that we use as adults that propel us forward, right? So um, the overachiever, can be somebody like Steve Jobs. So now, not to say that he's a perfect human being, but he accomplished a lot because of 
his structures that he built and because of his internal natural genius, right? We all have natural genius and we all have these sort of layered constructs. And so, um, so they're not a bad thing. Um, it's just, we have an opportunity to recognize when they're maladaptive and, and bring them back into a little bit better balance as we get older, because the gifts that we develop, they get to, they get to stay with us. As we correct these maladaptive patterns, we get the gifts. So the gift of the overachiever, or for, for me, it was trying to figure everything out. It was very mental, uh, figuring out uh, good at problem solving, looking at the whole picture, because that's how, that's one of the things that, that I used as a means of safety of understanding my environment. So um, we get to keep these. And so it's resolving these traumas and, and bringing them back into balance, metabolizing, digesting some of them, the things that are stuck, we still get to keep the gifts. And I think that that's so important that you said that, because I think that it could be easy for someone to deduce from this conversation. It's like, well, we're all fucked and it uh, doesn't matter what we do. And we're just all going to hell in a handbasket. And I think that one of the things that I, so I have not done, um, any master plants yet. Uh, I've done some of the more synthetic, uh, I've dabbled in MDMA uh, several times, LSD, et cetera. But one of the things that it's given me is it's, it's, it's allowed me to unhitch. So it's just like you said, you know, you get to keep the gift. I always thought that working myself until my eyes bled, right? Like working myself until I was burnt out was my advantage. Like I could always work harder and longer than anyone else. And you see in modern society, that is very much celebrated. That is an addiction that is very much celebrated. We see, you know, the Steve Jobs example would be a really great one where he probably worked himself to the bone. And uh, I mean, I don't know much about his story, so I can't actually really comment on that as a great example, but I I've heard quotes where it's like, I may not be the most talented, but I'm the hardest working, you know? So I've internalized those messages, but doing some of these psychedelic, um, experiences or having some of these ex uh, experiences have allowed me to unhitch the productivity aspect from my worth. Like I always, those two were like a completely overlapping circle for me. So I was able to really separate those two. And, and I think it's important that you just said that you get to keep the gift, you get to keep the, the, the thing that you developed, but it's just in this, in your constant evolution, there are going to be tools that are going to get you, you know, so far along the way, they're going to be tools that are going to help you survive, uh, you know, an abusive situation or a traumatic situation or whatever it might be. But then those tools sort of flip at some point, there's a continuum where they begin to flip and become more destructive than they are constructive. Um, so I'm really glad that you said that. Um, so someone's listening and they're saying, okay, I get it. I may have some of these like societal, maybe I'm a workaholic, maybe I'm, you know, or maybe I have some of these, uh, constructs, these layered levels of, um, of constructs that we've been talking about. How does somebody now begin? And we can, we can parse this with the conversation around plant medicines and other verticals if you'd like, but how do we begin to heal the wound and to begin to nourish the spirituality, the emotional intelligence, the innate, force we how do we get how do we begin to heal that mm. it's a very good question it's a very complicated question because the how is going to be different for every single person um the best direction that i can say is take action and and begin to follow whatever is calling you that could be switching jobs that could be leaving a marriage that could be getting married that could be having children or it could be um, uh, pursuing a new career, whatever it is for you, um, or a hobby, it could be uh, painting, whatever. Whatever's calling you, follow that. That is the thing that's gonna lead to the awakening of you. That's it, that, that's the thing. Where we get stuck is we, 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 we get paralyzed and we stop living. So it's, I, I know this seems like maybe a, a BS answer, but it's really just start, you gotta start living. Do more living. Um, and, and follow your heart. Um, so that's the way out, right? And, and I'll give you an example from my own experience. Mine just came from trying to resolve the health issues that I was dealing with. That led me down a path that steered me away from engineering into being a health practitioner. At that point, I, I wasn't on a path to uh, deconstruct my traumas and, and heal those wounds. That naturally arose through, through the passion that I was living and it showed me the way. This happens all the time. 
Um, and, and it can come from art. It can come from a million different things. Um, it can come from motherhood. Being a mother or father uh, is a fantastic way to really look at, at your wounds and, and start to unravel them. Um, but start to follow those things. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's yoga. Maybe it's uh, anything. But follow those. Um, ultimately, what I find is that it is the practices um, like meditation, yoga, um, uh, working with any kind of teacher or a spiritual teacher. Um, and that can be uh, even like a doctor can be a sort of spiritual teacher if they're coming at it from the right way. Um, but taking a look, an honest look at what you're dealing with um, is important. And so um, it's a lot of self-reflection sometimes. Sometimes you just go out in nature and you'll start to get answers. Um, so so that's, that's, that's as far as I can really go with that question because it's, it's so individualized. Um, for some people, it's going to be going, uh, flying down to Peru and going directly into the jungle for a month to, to study with master plants directly. For some people, it's going to be a short flight to Costa Rica at a really fancy retreat center to be able to do four or five nights of ayahuasca um, and, and figure things out. For some people, it's a, going to an ashram. Um, you know, there, there's a million ways to start to uncover this. Um, but I think I think as an individual, you have to be ready and willing to start to, to take that journey. And, and that happens, that point of readiness is different for everybody. Um, but I think there does come a point where you st you're, you're starting, you kind of stand face to face with yourself and go, do I really want to look at what's underneath this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't know you're there and, and then you wake up and you go, oh crap, here we are. Um, and, yeah. and, and sometimes it, it blindsides you, but sometimes you have that, that point where you can really recognize it. And, and for, for a lot of us, we're engaged in habitual patterns that are really designed. We, we actually create them to avoid looking at ourselves. Yeah, they're um, more automated. and mm -hmm. that, That's why they're there, you know, because yeah. if you really sat and just experienced what you're feeling, um, then that, that gets you to a place of very, um, it's just disquieting. It's, this, it's uncomfortable, right? Even for somebody like me, I, I'm a classic doer, right? That's, that's how I got through uh, this world. And so- one of the edges for me is in not doing, is in just being. And then if I'm, do, if I'm just being for long enough, there's something in my system. There's parts of me that go, oh, this isn't safe. You've got to go do something, right? But then there's other aspects where I go, no, no, this is where, and, and, and when I say do nothing, I, I can literally be not even meditating because that's, that's uh, doing something. Doing something. I know. Right. I'm like, oh, that's exactly how I am. I'm like, right. I'm going to take every day, a day off, but I can probably stretch and do some yoga and maybe some, some sauna therapy. That's like doing nothing, right? Exactly. So, <laughs> so you can, and this is interesting, this doing and being, you can, you can do yoga from a place of doing. You can also do yoga from a place of being. Meditation from a place of doing. I must meditate. Here I am. I'm going to accomplish something. I'm going to, my brain's going to get, uh, you know, whatever you're, you're doing it. And, and that in and of itself, well, it will be helpful. There's a deeper practice of just being. So, so for me, the more I sit in being and less doing, the more I start to, I can feel it like, Oh God, we got to get out of here. We got to do something. And, and it can be so strong that it'll be subconscious or unconscious. So, um, it's, it really takes looking at yourself and, 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 and getting uncomfortable, being okay with getting getting uncomfortable. And that's a continual process of being uncomfortable as we start to engage these aspects of ourselves because these traumas aren't just these character types that I'm talking about. Um, they're also belief systems. Am I worthy? Am I enough? Correct. Uh, yes. I'm a limited being. I'm not that powerful. Um, I'm, I'm not. Or I'm only worthy when I'm only, yes. you know, there's, there's qualifiers. It's only when right. I've done this. It's going to take me a long time. Healing is going to take forever. I have so much work to do, whatever the case is. And so these are beliefs. These are limited beliefs um, that, that are there. And those limited beliefs come from somewhere, right? They come from somewhere. And, you, and usually they come from a conditioning um, stemming from, from childhood and perhaps even before. Right. And you said something that I just wanted to highlight because while it is difficult to give advice in terms of what, you know, anyone who's listening to the podcast right now might be thinking, well, God, like, where do I start? And I think paying attention to your desires, you said something along the lines of pay attention to the calling, what it is that yeah. you're drawn to do, because your desires are meant for you. You know, I'm never going to have the desire to be an NBA 
football or is that the right one? No, basketball. <laughs> I'm never <laughs> clearly. I'm not you just outed yourself right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never gonna. I don't want to be a pro soccer player, basketball player, football. Those are because that does that. That's not meant for me. Right. So if you can, you know, if you're listening to this, you're like, okay, where, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to go to Peru? Like what, you know, what is it that you really want? What do you keep thinking about? Mm -hmm. this is not, you know, and this is like at, you know, in bed at like, these are your super private thoughts. What are the things that you keep thinking about the thoughts that keep coming up? This is like the whispering. This is like the, you know, the wisdom of your body sort of trying to get up from the ethers above, you know, above your throat and into your brain around what it is that that uh, is right for you. And I love that you said that everybody has a, a genius because I believe that is true for everybody. Every, even if you don't, even if you think you're the most untalented, you have a genius. I mean, just by virtue of being here, right? Like you won the lottery, essentially you won the lottery by being here. And there, there has to be something that makes you uniquely and beautifully you. So that would be, you know, if someone's like, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. It would well, be listening. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I want to add something to that too, because it's important. And, and I'll give you an example of something that was very interesting. Um, the, the, the first experience I had with um, sort of a, a psychedelic actually came from me starting a podcast. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I said, I was, there was something holding me back from starting my own podcast. I started my, my podcast and that led me to meeting somebody who then was able to help facilitate that experience for me. So had I not started that podcast, I wouldn't have had that experience, at least not so soon, probably would have happened later. It wouldn't happen in that way. And, um, and yet the podcast for me was a, was a short-term thing. It was a stop, not a stay, right? So, so the thing that, that is calling you, it may be an edge, you may be afraid of it. It may be temporary. It may not be your long-term thing. It may be a trip that you've never gone on a trip by yourself and you just go, decide to go on a trip by yourself into Europe and then uh, up to Iceland and then, you know, whatever. Um, follow that because that can precipitate a chance encounter, um, an inspiration, something. And so if you don't know what you're, 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 you're doing and you don't know where to start, I think I, I should have said this earlier, but, but it's, it's, it's really important, especially if you don't know where to start set an intention. This is basically you making sort of a soul contract or a, um, an agreement with, with God, so to speak, of really what you want. And this is, this is, it comes from the heart. It's something deep. What is your intention? And it's not a desire. This is an intention. This means I'm going to do this. Not, this is what I will achieve. This is wh what I will be, whatever the case is. Set that intention and forget the how. Right? So if you have an intention to be uh, a singer, then that, then, and that is your intention. And so you, you really set that intention and then you, you follow that calling. So um, I think setting an intention when you're lost and you have no clue what to do, setting an intention for what really what you're aiming to, to, to do or achieve or be is, is really important. Let's move into a little deeper. Let's wade a little deeper into the pool. Let's talk a little bit more about some of these master plans with mm -hmm. ayahuasca, with San Pedro. Um, let, and we can talk a little bit around the science. I would love for you to, I know that you're very well versed in this. Um, and this is, you know, we were talking in the pre-chat, like you love to talk about the science, but it's much more interesting for you to really talk about how these things can facilitate healing uh, in, in terms of a wide variety of people and, and, and all of that. But I know that you're very well versed in that. So for the people that are still not speaking your language completely, let's talk about um, what are some of the, you know, define what ayahuasca is and what are some of the um, uses for it. And maybe even before we do that, it might be worthwhile talking a little bit about the history of psychedelics. Cause like in the fifties and sixties, this was like the premier thing. It was like the premier topic in psychiatry. And, you know, then we sort of moved into the eighties, this world, our war on drugs kind of thing. So maybe talk there, and then we can kind of move into ayahuasca and San Pedro. Yeah. So uh, let me just first say that I come from a science background as a mechanical engineer. I love the sciences. Yes. Um, that is like my bread and butter, which is, is the physical sciences and really looking at science. Um, it wasn't until I started experimenting and exploring these things um, directly that I sort of dropped some of that and brought in a, a, a more holistic perspective. But speaking of the science, and when we talk about magic mushrooms and LSD and 
ayahuasca, you know, DMT, which is the active ingredient in ayahuasca, and, and I'll get into more of that. But the, the psychoactive aspect that, that most people are studying um, has to do with the neurotransmitter uh, receptor primarily, uh, serotonin, right? So serotonin is just a neurotransmitter. Um, and we're looking at how these things bind to these receptors in the, in the central nervous system, right? We typically call, we typically say the brain, but I'll say central nervous system and, and elsewhere actually. Um, but these things bind uh, to uh, neuronal cells and they, they unleash a cascade of effects, right? Various neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, all these things start to, to this alchemical mixture happens in the brain. Um, and in the central nervous system that facilitates an experience. Um, and so that's really what the science is studying, right? Um, and we can get, you know, they're typically referred to as 5-HT2A receptors. Um, and these are just tryptamine uh, that, that are affecting these things. So what's interesting is that when they look at this stuff, when, when, they're, when people take mushrooms, for example, there's this hyperconnectivity between certain regions of the brain that don't typically communicate at that high level when we're in a traditional cognitive space. So we're seeing all this, this global network start to establish itself and new neural pathways start to get laid. So typical neural pathways that are, that are grooved essentially, um, they get sort of sidetracked and new neural pathways get laid down. And that facilitates sort of some of the long lasting changes. We also see um, neurons grow. So we have something called neurogenesis, right? So this is actually, we can grow new brain, right? New, new nervous system, which is fascinating. So these are some of the big things that people are looking at. Um, you know, they've also looked at uh, sort of the physiological and neurobiological sort of uh, architecture and, and chemistry. And what they see is that it's, it's similar to what happens when we uh, go into REM sleep, right? So the dreamlike state is very, very similar to the sort of psychedelic trip, so to speak. So um, we've, it stimulates uh, glutamate, which is another neurotransmitter, and brave derived neurotrophic factor. So BDNF, um, that is um, very protective for the brain. Um, it's, it's beautiful for things like, for preventing things like Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, BDNF is, is fantastic. So this is, there's some really amazing benefits to the brain and nervous system itself. What's interesting, um, there was a study uh, with, with mushrooms and they looked at the dose, right? So how much uh, psilocybin, uh, which is the active component or psilocin, um, psilocybin is, is the component that um, doesn't degrade very easily. So it actually doesn't oxidize. So it's in the mushroom. Once we ingest it, then it actually converts to psilocin and that's the sort of main psychoactive component. Um, they, they noticed that the music actually is more impactful for a um, pleasurable experience or a meaningful experience. So the music actually had more of an important role than the dose did. So they, they, they increased the dose and they, they noticed the, the, the positive effects, right? How much impact this trip had on somebody that was doing it for therapy. And, and they noticed that the music actually made more of a difference. So I don't know how many drugs out there or uh, pharmacological agents out there other than these psychedelic sort of plants how much of them how many of them incorporate music and and would say that they're more impactful when certain music is played so there's something very interesting going on between the experience and the actual sort of medicine as it's interacting with us so um so that, that's really what what we're looking at and uh, there's just certain aspects of, of the nervous system is inhibited, right? Down-regulated, uh, particularly in parts of the brain. Certain parts of the brain are, are down-regulated and certain parts are excited, right? So they're up-regulated. Um, and so it's, it's, that's really what we're looking at and we're studying. And, and there's a lot of research in this, in this realm. Um, the more primitive areas of the brain, like the limbic system, right? This is the emotional uh, center. So the hippocampus, the anterior cingulate, cingulate cortex, um, these are things that are highly linked to emotional um, thinking and, and memory. So uh, psilocybin actually increases um, the function in those parts of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, which is like your high level thinking, um, complex behaviors, uh, that gets down-regulated, right? This is why you can kind of feel the drunkness when you, when you take some of these 
these things. Um, and then there's a and why part you can't of the, think your way out of it. Like you can't, uh, you know, you really can't, uh, yeah. you really can't. And, and you, and you actually don't have too much of an inclination. Usually um, if, if you take enough, uh, there's no inclination to think your way out. You're just in the experience. Right. So, um, so it's very interesting. And, and there's a, there's an aspect that people are looking at um, of the brain called the default mode network. And it's just a, it's an orchestrated part of the brain that we've sort of identified as a plays a huge role in the identification of self, right? So me as a separate self identity, um, that's essentially, it's, it's heavily regulated by this default mode network of the brain. And, and that, that allows us to make sense of the world and, and my part in it, or at least that's a, a big part of it. So um, things like psilocybin, ayahuasca, they will downregulate that aspect of the brain. This is why if you take enough, you start to get this sense that I'm not disconnected, that we are all one that we're all connected. So there's interesting things that we're noticing when these, when these substances are, are taken. Um, the question I have is, so, so what? In other words, okay, great. What I see these things uh, useful for in the lab is studying the brain. They will help us understand the brain much better. And this is what was really being done in the 50s and 60s and 70s. They were studying the brain. How do we understand the brain? And the nervous system. So I think the, the, these these substances are fantastic for that. What I don't think we're going to have very much success at is studying the effects of these things. What we're in terms of our experience. So we can't we can study the objective reality of how it's affecting the brain and the nervous system. I think we're going to do a poor job of studying the subjective reality that the user experiences, because what you see going on uh, in terms of, of the brain and the nervous system and, and the connections and all the things happening is very different than what I experience. So um, that's really where I see the research going and, and finding a tremendous value and is, in, is in studying essentially the anatomy and the function of, of the brain and the nervous system. But when you work with shamans and you work with some of the indigenous um, cultures, they work in such a different way and there's so much more magic that happens that will never be explained by hard science, in my opinion. And, and it's, it's almost hard for me to get into that because there's, there's so much that goes on, but they are working on a different level. And, and there's something more than just the substance. So in other words, e even in the West, we're acknowledging this reality. When you give people MDMA uh, assisted psychotherapy or psilocybin uh, mushroom assisted psychotherapy, you're not just giving somebody these substances and shoving them in a room to, to deal with their own stuff. They're actually working with them. So there's something about the practitioner in the experience that facilitates the positive sort of long-term aspect of these things. So this is what the shamans have been doing for thousands of years. You asked about the history. History of these things goes back at least 5,000 years, probably more like 10,000 um, all over the world, uh, not just in South America. This, these substances were used in Asia. There's mushrooms um, and, and in the hieroglyphics uh, of of ancient Egypt. Um, there's many uh, researchers and, and books on this topic of mushrooms being used in, in Egypt. Um, in fact, the story of Christmas um, is heavily tied to the Amanita mascara, uh, potentially, uh, the red and white mushroom. Um, and and there, there's a lot of theory about uh, the Amanita mascara, which grows on the, uh, the roots of trees, evergreen trees, and they're being picked, right? So you get your present under the tree. It's being picked by the shaman or Santa Claus, so to speak. Um, and Santa Claus really comes from San Nicolas, right? That, that's really where the name Santa Claus comes from, San Nicolas. But the reindeer used to eat these mushrooms. And, um, and then they would, at, when they would urinate, other reindeer would drink that. And they would notice that uh, they would be tripping out. Um, and so, uh, so your reindeers come into the story there. And, and Siberia is where these, these things typically uh, were used by these shamans. And the thought is, is that potentially they were dropping them down the chimney. Um, because of the heavy snow drift that would potentially block doors. Um, and so they would deliver them around the solstice, um, these mushrooms to, to the various residents of the village. And they would uh, have, and it's a pagan uh, tradition, have this experience on the shortest day of the year, um, which is when sort of the maximum nightfall or spirit world is present. And uh, there's a very common experience when you take mushrooms to see elves or dwarves or uh, little people of gnomes of, of certain kind. And it's thought that 
that that is sort of the world or the the plane of existence that you tap into. And so there's a lot of tradition. And I, and I say that not because that's hard fact, but there's a lot of story and there's a lot of interesting similarities and, and things uh, about our current uh, tradition. But these things go back into Asia, uh, the Middle East, um, Africa. I mean, it's all over the place. So these things are very, very ancient. And it's only in the, in the, late, in the last 60, 70 years that we've really began to explore these things on a different level. And I think there's use in studying them from a Western perspective, as long as, well, there's use, period. And there's use um, to explore them from the shamanic perspective. And I think if we're wise enough to bring those two um, viewpoints together, then we'll gain the maximum benefit as we introduce these things into our modern culture. Right. And, you know, lack of evidence in the Western paradigm is not evidence of lack, right? If you yes. think about if we have been, um, you know, alongside developing alongside or have interacted with these psychedelic compounds for 5,000, 10,000 years, I mean, there's a reason why there's receptors in the brain that respond to these, you know, it's not, when you drink water, you don't have, you don't trip out, right? I mean, hopefully, I, hopefully where you're living, not you usually, know, yeah. not, not usually, right. But when you take uh, you know, mushrooms or whatever, whatever plant medicine we're, we're referring to that has a, an effect, as you were saying on the central nervous system, because we have developed receptors for it. So there's been, there has to be, I mean, just from inductive re there has to be some sort of, um, uh, development alongside in parallel with these compounds. Yeah, th th this is the great question that Terrence McKenna and many others have, have long been questioning, um, which is, why do these things work so well with us? In other words, why right. is there such an amazing partnership? Right. And, and, and it, it's like a key that fits in a lock so beautifully. Um, so, so there is, there has to be a, a co-relationship, a co-development that's deep in our, in our history and our past. Um, but, but there's something else I want to point to here, which is that the research is so infantile right now when it comes to the Western world. We don't know anything about the brain. We know so little about the brain. So to, to presuppose that we understand these things on a scientific level is laughable. Um, the, other, the other aspect is, again, we keep pointing to the brain, like we're obsessed with this thing in our head. <laughs> the, the brain is fantastic, don't get me wrong, but the central nervous system goes throughout our entire body. Correct. Beyond the central nervous system, we also have the enteric nervous system, which is a nervous system of the gut, right? And that actually independently of the central nervous system. So when you take the, and it has uh, serotonin receptors as well. So when you take these substances, you're actually affecting the gut neuronal integrity. You know how many people that have digestive issues, autoimmune conditions, uh, immune system challenges of all kinds, most of the immune system is in the gut, is in the enteric nervous system area. So we have these, these complexes of nerve fibers throughout the body. Heart is another amazing neuronal structure Right? It gives off much stronger uh, magnetic field than, than the brain. Um, there's, there's way more neurons in, in the heart. So these things affect the heart. They affect all the neurons throughout the body. Um, and, and it goes so much further than just the DMT or dimethyltryptamine that comes from uh, the chacruna, uh, which is just a, a leaf uh, in, in, um, in the jungle. Um, so it, there's plants that contain DMT, right? Which is the, the primary psychoactive component that gives you the trip. Um, but there's also other things, right? In the vine of, of the ayahuasca. So you combine two plants with ayahuasca in the vine, um, Benisteriopsis copy typically, um, that is going to contain harmaline, harmine, um, and, and tetraharmaline, I believe as well. These also have uh, receptors. Uh, uh, we also have receptors for these these substances, and they are sort of psychoactive in their own right. To what degree, we're not quite as sure if we don't study them nearly as, as um, thoroughly. But also, there's a synergistic effect. So um, it's it's interesting when you look at these things, and, and to think that those are the only two is probably ridiculous as well. When you drink something like ayahuasca, it's this deep red blood-like color, deep brown blood color. And so I'm thinking of somebody in the West and we do green juicing and we do, we drink beet juice and we drink all these amazing colorful juices. Well, ayahuasca is just that, right? So there's, there's compounds on a the polyphenolic layer as well. So there's polyphenols, there's all kinds of plant chemicals in these substances that are interacting with not only our nervous system of the gut, but the gut microbiota. So now we know that all disease right. begins in the gut, right? And uh, the microbiome and the microbiota is a huge area of study. It's exploded over the last 20 years. Well, my question is, is what does something like ayahuasca do to the gut, gut ecosystem? 
perhaps it is impactful on the ecosystem level of the gut in such a way that forgetting the psychoactive component, it's going to have tremendous health benefits. Perhaps it's resetting the neural pathways in the gut to, uh, to end and to, to help heal things like um, uh, anything, that, uh, excess production of lipopolysaccharides or um, you know, any IBD or IBS, Crohn's disease. There's a million different things going on, right? And then of course, it's all being uh, filtered through the liver and the kidneys and the spleens in, in play. So there's so much going on that I think we are, again, we're, we're, our, our focus is so narrow that we're probably missing the main function of the physical interaction with the body itself. I've actually drank ayahuascas that have that I can sense and feel and experience on a central nervous system level. It'll I'll have tremors, tremors or I'll shake. Um, I can I can sense it in sort of the brain, the higher brain level. It's a very different experience, and I've had different ayahuascas that are really affecting the gut, and and they will give me diarrhea. And there's one called yahe, which is the Colombian version, which is slightly different plants. It actually has a more purgative effect uh, coming out the rear. Um, and then there's other uh, ayahuascas that I've had that are, that are really, really heart opening. And I can feel it activating the heart center. And so as I began working with ayahuasca, I thought, wow, this is amazing. You're working on the central nervous system, a different one's working on the enteric nervous system, and you have a, a, a different brew that's working on the heart nervous system. And so what's the difference? Sure, some of the ingredients may be a little bit different, but also the prayers and the intention that the shaman's putting into it when they're making the brew. That was fascinating to me. To, and, and to that's not a story. That's a direct, I mean, it's a story for, for, for you guys, but for me, it's a direct experience. I experienced this. So I know it to be true that these things can affect different systems of the body and, and having a different effect uh, on you. So when you have a subjective experience like that, I don't know how you're going to study that in the laboratory. Perhaps we can. But the intention of the shaman, the, the work that's going, it, it, when he's making it or she's making it, as well as the intention and the practice during the ceremony itself, because they're doing work, they're a practitioner, and they're working in ways that we don't fully um, acknowledge perhaps here in, in the West typically, but, but they're nevertheless working. And I've seen some amazing things happen in that space as well. So there's so much going on. And so to, to think that it's just this chemical that's inducing an effect in the brain or the body and that produces all the magic, I'm sorry, that's just not the case. That's a small fraction of the, of the, of the, of the aspect of it. Um, so, so there's a lot more to look at when it comes to what's really doing the healing. And what you're saying here is, is something I want to dive into, which is the set and the setting and the intention as you've been talking about, because now, as you've mentioned earlier in our conversation, uh, at the top of our conversation, you said, well, now there's, you know, ceremonies every week, you can go to someone's house and, you know, there's, and you see that, and this is maybe partially why, you know, I have done uh, with a wonderful facilitator, uh, MDMA and some of these more, um, uh, human constructs, uh, of plant of, of a psychedelic experience. But I, what I think is really important is the set and the setting. And you see people now that are, you know, basically doing this every weekend, um, or, you know, every other weekend or whatever. And it, and, and we can maybe have a bit more of a nuanced discussion around this and not, I'm not calling anything good or bad, but I think that the, at least for me, when you, when you, when you have reverence for the plant and when you have this intention going into it, that this is going to help with deep healing, or it's going to allow you to come to a realization that you may not have otherwise come, come to without years and years of therapy, which was my experience. It was like seven or eight hours. And I felt like I had done 20 years of therapy in that one session. Um, but it's the, it's the integration that happens afterwards for me that have been, that, that has been, I've, I've only done four sessions, but those four sessions have absolutely changed the, the way that I feel about myself. I have much mm -hmm. more empathy for myself and what I have, you know, gone through and uh, that punitive voice that I still have, she's still there. Mm -hmm. but I, I have another voice now. Like it's really kind of nice to have someone that's like, you know what, you're actually doing the best you can, you know? Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about integration because I think that what I see now, and this may be completely incorrect. This is just my perception, but I do see 
people doing it all the time now. And I wonder if this is now leaning on or replicating what we saw in the sixties and seventies, where we started seeing MDMA being used. And then it was like kind of cut into ecstasy with other stuff. And then everyone's like, oh my God, like, this is like, this is crazy. We have to shut this down. Talk to us about integration and why that's so important. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge there's a, there's a piece of me, there's a part of me, and this comes from, again, the, the trauma and then the childhood. It's very critical. That it likes to judge, judge things and judge experiences and judge people and judge these things. Um, and so I just want to name that to sort of acknowledge that that's present here too, right? That there's one that wants to judge the, this thing that we're talking about, right? And yeah. I can hear your voice too. You're yeah. like, this is wrong, um, <laughs> right? So there's, this is, this, these, are the con- these are the constructs, right? These are the beautiful right. constructs that's that we true. get laid down. And so um, ultimately my view on, on that is, well, let me, let me put it in this way. If you, you can, there's a million ways to be, a, to be a singer, quote unquote, right? You can be the drunk girl that goes to the bar and sings karaoke. And that's the only time you sing, right? There's the one that likes to sing in the car because just, she's just, that's just what she loves. She just loves to just let it out and belt in the car. And then there's the singer who wants to do it competitively because her parents want her to. And then there's the singer who just loves this thing and is going to become a professional because that's what she does. And she studies it and she practices and she has coaches and you, you see the difference. There's a million different ways to approach singing. Which one's right or which one's wrong? Which one's better? Which one's worse? I don't know. You determine whatever's right for you. So I think the same thing applies to any spiritual development, any spiritual path and any practice and any medicine, any drug that you want to take. So I believe that you can actually take heroin intentionally with a different approach than perhaps an addict or somebody who's trying to drown their pain. And there's actually people out there that do this in sort of a more spiritual way. I would never advocate for it. I don't want to do it. But, but I, I sort of use that polarized view to suggest that there are people, um, I, well, one of the grandfathers that, that, that um, comes from a lineage that I've, that I've had the, the pleasure of drinking ayahuasca with, he was 110 when he passed. He was drinking ayahuasca for like 80 something, 90 years. And, and of course he was, he was leading and he was a, he was a taita, he was basically teaching. Um, but um, so he drank ayahuasca for 90 years, 80 years, whatever it was. Can, should we judge that? Or, or was he doing that from a different place than perhaps somebody else? And I know plenty of other people who have drank ayahuasca hundreds of times and they don't seem to be any further along in their um, human development or uh, emotional development or spiritual development. They just seem to be blown out and they've had amazing experiences, but they're not going anywhere in, in human form, so to speak, right? So there's an acknowledgement that we're human first. Well, I'm gonna say first, we are human. Uh, we're just human as well, right? So we can be a star being, we can be this awareness, we can be this etheric aspect that's a part of us, and we're also human. So my approach is to use these things to improve my experience and my service here as a human while I'm on earth. That's why I use them. Um, and, and when I don't feel called, I, I don't do it. And when I do, I, I, I try to do that to the best of my ability. So, so you can, it's, it depends on how you go in. If you go in with just this, oh, I'm just curious. I just want to see what this is all about. Cool. That's great. That's probably going to get you a different experience than somebody who goes in and goes, I'm, I, I want to go in and I really want to see what it's about, who I am. I want to see what this can teach me, what I can teach myself. I want to really see what this is, is, is and, and what I can do with it. And there's the person that says, I want to go and follow in a lineage. And I want to dedicate my, at least a year of my life to this and see where it takes me, right? So there's a lot of ways to do this. I think many people are going in with the energy of, I'm going to go drink to fix this problem. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. Um, I have cancer. I have whatever the case is. And you go in with using it as a pill. That's not wrong either. It, it has, I've seen it do amazing things for physical ailments. So if that's your goal and if that's how you're using it, great. Go in with that real intention to heal that thing or to fix that thing. You might find that it's going to uncover something else, that the reason for your cancer was because of this other thing over here, that the reason you're depressed is because of this thing that happened when you were three and you don't remember it. There's a lot of things that may come up and what I, the way I look at these sort of psychoactive plants, master plants, plant medicines, and even things like MDMA and, and LSD, what have you, 
to, to, to a lesser degree. I, I'm not a huge fan uh, as much as I am of the natural stuff. I've, I've used LSD, I've used MDMA, but I like the natural stuff. And um, I think what really what's happening is that on the very basic level, they are showing you a different perspective of your reality. So I think you alluded to this, that it was a, through the experience, you were able to open up to a new viewpoint that you didn't recognize before. There was a deep love for yourself. You actually do care for yourself. There's a compassionate side. There's an understanding part of you that goes, oh man, yeah, you, were, you went through some stuff. Like take, you know, it's okay. You, right. you are an okay person, right? Um, and, and that part is at, is at odds with the other part that you develop that says, you got to be critical of yourself because if you don't, you're going to die or bad things are going to happen. You're not going to get love, right? That was the construct that was laid down, whatever it was for you. And I'm sort of uh, improvising here, but, but that's what happens. And so generally when people go in, they, they, get, they get a perspective, perhaps a memory. People have remembered being abused at two years old, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, you can understand things from a different perspective. That is, I think, one of the things that happens um, from a cognitive perspective that you can take away. And with that new understanding, then you, you integrate, you, you actually put that into, in, into your life. So you may need to do something different. You may need to put down a practice, a self-love practice, a gratitude practice. You may need a meditation practice, whatever the case is, but something that happens afterward that allows that thing that you recognize or the thing that you realize to stick. Because that, this is important. If you recognize something, if you have these sort of aha moments during an experience and you don't put that into practice afterwards and you don't sort of establish that practice or establish that belief or whatever it is, you can actually turn out, it, it can, you can actually develop more suffering and more hardship because now you're aware of something, right? And, and so in other words, you have something that's going on that you're, that's out of alignment and you recognize why it's out of alignment, but you don't do anything about it. Now you have the knowledge. Now you have the one going, you should be doing that thing. Why aren't you doing that thing? You know better. Here you are again, eating this thing, doing this thing, going to have sex with that guy, doing this, drinking all the time, whatever it is. Now there's a judgment component because there's, there's a part of you that recognizes why it's happening. So there becomes a real opportunity after the experience to, to ingrain that thing whatever it is that, that, that made you recognize this new perspective. So, so I think that's important. The, the other thing is, is again, you mentioned this, the set and uh, the setting. The people that you're doing this with and the energy and the place that you're doing it is important. Um, this is where the shamans come into play, particularly in the, in the lineages. There's one component, which is safety, ultimate safety for your life. You know, um, People, especially with things like ayahuasca are very intense experiences. It's, it's usually, well, from my experience, there's very little danger in, in it causing harm to the physical body unless, you, unless you're on other medications. Um, the, the danger becomes being sort of tripped out and, and making a decision, you know, doing something stupid because you don't, you're not in the right mindset. You're, you're kind of off in, in another place. So having somebody there to protect you in that, in that regard. Um, you can fall over things. And I mean, there's just, there's just bad things that can happen unless you have somebody that's actually watching you from a physical level. So that's, that's step one. But then when we open ourselves up, we're opening our being up. Um, we're letting our guard down. That's really the default mode network, the ego, the, the protective aspects of ourself. Um, and even on an energetic level, we, we are sort of encased and closed, keeping ourselves safe on an energetic level, spirit level. When we open ourselves up, in these environments, we're literally becoming vulnerable. It's, it's like a turtle that's just taken off its shell. There's a lot of opportunity for danger to, to occur. And this can happen on the spiritual level. This can happen on the energetic level. Um, and so this is where the shaman can come into play to both keep, keep hold the container to keep energetically safe and also influence the energies, influence the, the aspects to bring healing, to bring balance, to bring alignment into your your energy to that's really what it's organizing the energy. And that's really what a lot of the shamans do and they have different tools and different things to, to work with that. So, um, so again, there's a lot of um, components to that, but the more experience and the, the more true a lineage is with the, with the plant medicines, um, I think the, the, the better hands you're in typically. Um, and so you know, there's a lot of Westernized shamans that have, you know, maybe drank ayahuasca 
hundred times and then they think they're a shaman because they've studied and they've got a pretty good grip on it. But there's so much nuance and and even the lineage itself is important as a teacher in some of these practices. So, um, so there's a lot to it. Um, I don't want to scare anybody, but I think doing your due diligence. The one thing I do like that's happening now in the world of ayahuasca and San Pedro, Huachuma, um, and some of these other sort of indigenous medicines is that you're actually seeing like Yelp reviews, right? You're actually seeing like these reviews uh, for treatment centers and um, uh, vacation spots and retreat places. So to me, that's actually a good sign because that is going to hold them accountable and it's going to at least give some transparency to the experience, even if it's not, let's say, fully informed, but it, there's at least some useful information there. You know, 30, 40 years ago, you just have to go down to the jungle and just hope for the best, right? So, um, so there's, there's a lot to it, but I think going in with an, with an intention for what you're, what you're there for and being serious with that, um, um, or at least being intentional. Maybe it doesn't have to be serious, but but being intentional uh, and being thoughtful for what you're what you're really there for is important. Because again, I've seen people that drink ayahuasca two hundred times, and it's they're just chasing an experience. That's it, and that that doesn't really solve any problems. It can actually bring more pain and suffering into your life. Because at some point, and I've seen this, people just they don't even want to be human anymore. They're like they just want to escape, and that's really what they're using it for. They're using it for an escape. So what's it going to feed? It's going to feed the escape. And you're just going to keep chasing that escape. And until so, someday, hopefully, you get woken up and go, oh, this is what I've been doing. I didn't even realize I was, I was trying to escape the whole time. I thought I was on a spiritual path. No, I was just escaping. So there's a real embodied way um, uh, to these experiences. And, and before I go on too long, I just also want to say here that I do believe that there's things that, that these psychedelics, these plant medicines can't get to the bottom of. Um, even in the presence of really, really good shamans. That said, really, really good shamans may be able to work some of these pieces that, that generally will require a co-regulation or another human, this connection piece. So, so there's pieces, I think, that are very difficult to get to in the world of plant medicines. Yeah, and I'll, I will completely admit that I'm still a young Padawan. Uh, so my, I, I wasn't meaning as, to- as am I, by the way, as yeah. am I. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I guess maybe what I was trying to get to and which you just, uh, said beautifully was that you can have this acute, um, conclusion or this solution that's presented to you, but if you don't do anything, and if, if that, if you, if you need the medicine multiple to hundreds, doesn't matter how many times, you know, you, you get this realization, but it begins to fade if you don't do anything with it. So it can always be like this door crack that's you sort of get the door crack open, but you never fully walk through. And that's sort of what I, uh, what I was trying to, uh, trying to get to, uh, obviously didn't get to it very well with my choice of words, but for me, if I had just had those experiences and then didn't start, for me, it was journaling. For me, it was uh, meditation. So those are kind of the one, two punches for me that were incredibly useful and not, you know, I'm by no means a, like I cannot meditate for an hour, but I can do like a pretty good 15 minute session twice a day. Like I've, you know, that's sort of my, uh, that really gives me a lot of peace. And I feel like I have more resilience and I have a bit more emotional regulation from that if I had just done those experiences and had the acute awareness that they had given me and not followed up with anything afterwards, it's just like you were saying, I would have known what it was. It was that I was completely focusing on the physical body and not working on my emotional and spiritual health. And then I would not, I, and then they're not meditating. They're not taking the time to practice, or just sometimes I'll wake up in the morning and I'm just I sit in my bed for five minutes and I'm just taking in all the senses. Like I'm listening, I'm tasting and smell, you know, like all, just all the things that time to be rather than to just get up and it's like, Oh, it's time for my workout. It's time for me to, do, you know, just all this always being in doing mode, this like very masculine living in my masculine all the time. Um, is but see that you, you're, you're pointing something really cool there, right? You're actually identifying this masculine feminine dynamic yes. that you, that for the, the, the exercising was just the the, the mode, but, but really it's a hyper masculinization, right? It's Correct. a doing it's a, and so that's, that's really cool. When we start to look at these bigger paradigms and we start getting this sort of union talk, right. And we start to look at archetypes and, and masculine feminine and, and all these different aspects of who we are, then 
this is when you start, you know, you really get to the core, in my opinion, of what's happening. You know, the problem isn't you doing. Um, the problem is the energy that creates the doing, right? right. And so, um, right. so it's, it's very interesting as you start to get to the, you start to peel back the layers and really see the source of what's happening. And then you start to recognize, oh, I can, I can still do if I'm doing it from a different energy. And if I bring in more maybe feminine aspects, I've had this myself, a feminine quality that I've tried to um, adopt more and more of is, is real good listening. So speaking is masculine, right? it's, it's project outward, receiving and listening is, is more feminine. So I have all these aspects of myself that I'm trying to cultivate a, a greater sense of, of feminine balance. Um, and so even receiving, I have a very hard time receiving compliments, receiving, receiving, like really receiving it. And so that's, that's something energetically that I'm trying to do more of is to really receive something. Um, so these are the coolest things that you can start to work and get to the core of what's really what's, where the imbalances are and the misalignments are. Um, and and you, start, you start thinking beyond the, the sort of superficial levels of this stuff. And yet at the same time, some of your realizations uh, from something like a deep ayahuasca experience might be that you need to nourish yourself more with food, that you're eating from a certain energy and that, that even if it's the right foods, if you're eating the right foods from, from the wrong, from a misaligned energy, maladaptive energy, then it's going to produce different results. So eating from a more nourishing place because you care for yourself and you know that this body is here for you and is you. Um, so, so there's all these different things that come about when your, your brain, your system, your whole system is opened up and configured in a way that allows you to see things a little bit differently. That's wonderful. I love that. And I, I think the, um, you know, it's, it's about yin and yang, right? You can't really truly appreciate your light. You can't truly, you know, be nourishing and loving of yourself. If you don't also, if you're not also dancing with your darkness, and if you don't have a full appreciation of what that might look like. Um, so I love that. And I, you know, very truthfully, and I'll just very, very open and open and honest, uh, and, and being transparent, I, I feel called to do ayahuasca. It's just, it's mm -hmm. what we were talking about before. I just want to make sure that, you know, before I let the thorns off around my heart, that, is, that I have a space that people can sort of contain that. So I, well, I, 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 they say that, they say that, um, she, she calls you, uh, yes. ayahuasca is, is known as the grandmother in most, most of the cultures. And they say that she calls you. Yeah. If you're feeling the calling, then it'll happen. And it'll happen at the divine time that is perfect for you. You may be ready but it may not be the best timing. And so, um, so it, these, are, these are some of the ways that I've started to think and operate um, partially because I began having these experiences with, with these plant medicines. I start, start opening myself up to new magic. And, and this is, I think, the, the, the cool thing, that whenever you do something like ayahuasca or maybe a, a really good strong psilocybin dose um, or DMT, if you have one of these boom, huge waking experiences, you can't undo that. Um, and so you get blasted open to a new level of reality that you will never go back away from. So, so, so something opens up for you and that, that is cool. And for me, that's where the magic, I was stuck in this very materialistic scientific reality and something like that, an experience, a direct experience broke down all the nonsense science that I'd ever learned. Um, and, and made it way more complex and magical. So, so there's really cool aspects of these, these plants that um, open up something for you in a new way. Um, and you, you, can't, you can't go back once you do it. Right. And just in the context of longevity, of course, you know, the human longevity project was a big, you know, project of yours for, for many years, you know, what's the point in living a long life? Like you can do all the science, you can do all the diets and the movement and the, the rehab and the, this and the, that. but if you're miserable and you hate yourself, you know, or you hate the people around you, or you hate the life that you've constructed. I mean, what is the point? Right. So I, I am becoming much more interested. Yes. I love the pathways. I love the nutrition. I love the biochem. I love that stuff. That'll always feed my, you know, learner archetype if there's such a thing. But I also think that there's value in pursuing, um, for without really having good language for it, what your soul wants, your desires, your essence, your being, because there's no, if you're 120 and, you know, 110 of those years have been like, just like, 
take, I'm I, like, just I'll die in a car crash. I'll be happier that way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm hundred percent with you. That was one of my arguments as we made the human longevity project, because I keep hearing these discussions of, uh, I'm going to be 150 and I'm going to live to 200 and we can live forever. And, and, and while philosophically that's, that's entertaining to go down those, those thought trains. I mean, I just, you're missing the big picture. And the big, the whole point is actually not to live a longer life. And in my opinion, very humbly, um, it's not to live a longer life. It's how can I be more present? That's it. So correct. the more we think about the future and how old I'm going to be and why I want to get there, the, the more I'm being taken out of the present moment. Mm-hmm. And so having a greater sense of presence and a, and a more stabilized sense of presence to me seems like a much more valuable objective. Yeah. And that itself can lead to a long life and, and, and stabilizing that presence will lead to a happier life, a more fulfilled life, uh, a life of well being. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it seems to me as I, you know, speak with many elderly people and, and pe- teachers of mine and study some of these indigenous ways and, and cultures that the real objective um, of pretty much every human life is to live a life of service. Um, that seems to be the core of, of everybody's purpose. And, and, and anybody who starts to realize that um, their purpose seems, there seems to be a, a sense of, of service. So the purpose and the vehicle um, that, that leads to service, I think is, is irrelevant. It's, it's whatever you prefer, right? That, that is your, whatever you wanna do. You wanna be a chiropractor, great. You wanna be a, a musician, fantastic. You know, um, you want to be a janitor. Great. Like the, the vehicle is, is irrelevant. It's how can you be of service, right? And and service to what and, and of what? And it seems to be the service of your presence, the service of your gifts, the service of your essence. So to me, the more I can deepen my presence, the more I can deepen my, the any embodiment of, of the essence that is me, the more I can bring myself through into this present moment, the more I can be of service. That's it. And so, so to me, this, is, this has been my continual practice. How do I continue to cultivate a deeper sense of presence? How do I con- continue to cultivate a deeper sense of, of my gifts, my essence, the, the unique thing that I bring into this world? How it manifests is, is whatever, you know, that, that's to be determined. But there's there's an, there's aspects of me that can come through and deliver something to this to this world, um, and and again, the service to others so that they can find themselves as well. And, and this is what m- it seems that my teachers are doing for me. They're bringing their gifts through and their their presence through for the benefit of me, so that I can find myself. And um, this seems to be what it's all about. And the more that we can do that for each other the greater, not only that, that we will be individually for in my own little world, but the greater the collective is, right? And, and that's really, we, we can't deny this reality of the collective. I mean, there's just actually too much research that shows um, that, 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 we, that, we aren't, that we are connected. So um, the, the Maharishi effect is probably the most famous, um, but there's plenty of, of studies out there. Um, that look at this. So, so to me, that's really what it seems to be all about. And so whether it's plant medicines, whether it's uh, meditation, whether it's yoga, Kundalini specifically, whether it doesn't matter, whether it's Qigong, there's a million modalities and tools and techniques. And there's people like Emerson that just walked out in nature, right? And so, so there's all kinds of ways to deepen uh, this presence and this aspect of ourselves. Um, but ultimately it does seem to come down to, do you have the willingness to to engage in that very brave adventure, right? It's the hero's journey. Um, and, and even with things like ayahuasca, some people call them a shortcut to enlightenment, so to speak. It, to me, it's, it's not that at all. It actually can be a more roundabout way for many. Um, they can actually get lost on that path um, to, to finding themselves again. A more direct route may actually be through some of these other lineages. You know, um, Dzogchen is a, a very um, great lineage um, uh, from the Buddhist sort of traditions. But that's really something brave to, to embark upon these psychedelic trips because they throw you, they hurl you into the abyss of yourself. And that is where you'll get lost. And believe me when I say, and, and again, I'm, I'm a novice as well in this, in this realm. I've 
had dozens of experiences and some are fantastic and I get taught amazing things about myself and about the world and about a lot of things. And then sometimes I'm face to face with a really horrendous experience. And ultimately that's just my own mind. That's, that's it. It's, and so these are hard things to face your shadow, to, to engage with your shadow pieces, the aspects of yourself that you hate, the aspects of yourself that you do, do not want to see and you don't want anybody else to see. To engage with those honestly and to be able to reveal those um, in a vulnerable way to yourself and to others is some of the scariest work that you can do. Um, and that's really what we're talking about when we, when we talk about these things like ayahuasca. I always find it funny that um, um, some of the people that drink ayahuasca for the first time, they're nervous about throwing up. Um, and, I, and I thought, wow, this, it's, it is funny, you know, that we, we have this thing. I'm nervous to vomit. I'm nervous to, to shit myself, whatever the case is. And those are perfect examples of this, this architecture that we've laid down to keep us safe, right? Like what's civilized um, and what's not. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how embarrassing it would be. No, no. Like once you start drinking ayahuasca enough, you'll see that this is, this is, is totally normal to vomit. Uh, it's quite normal to, to crap. Um, and piss yourself. That happens uh, more than you might think. And when it does happen, nobody cares because everybody that's drinking with you understands. Some of the, the shamans that have been drinking for decades or, you, uh, or even longer, they've all done it themselves. So, um, so and, and the reason that you do that is because you're actually moving some of these stuck energies, these belief systems, these, these ideas, these thought patterns, um, and even the physical things that are stuck in our body um, are being removed. Uh, through these mechanisms, um, even through tears, through yawning, these are ways that we're able to clear this energy and uh, and and make room for something new, something fresh, a new idea, a new belief, a new pattern. Um, but this stuff is 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 hard work sometimes, and and it does require bravery. But the bravery is not in that you'll see some demon or anything like that. It's not about the hallucination. In fact, when I drink ayahuasca, I generally don't have a lot of these sort of hallucination, hallucination experiences in, in, in some of the uh, other cultures, they call them pintas, right? This, uh, so it's like painting, this like view. I don't have a lot of that. I, I actually have a lot of like knowing. I get a lot of like direct experience of, of understandings, these sort of brain dumps. Um, and even on a deeper level, you have these mystic experiences that go beyond the, the visual. So, so it's not about that. It's, it is about facing your, your own self. And, and that is some of the scariest work, no matter what tradition that you follow. Wonderfully said. Wonderfully said. You mentioned before, I just wanted to, in wrapping our conversation, I feel like I could talk to you for the next day. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's you fun stuff. It's great stuff. Um, that you were filming, but you've been just with the whole world being on pause. Uh, what, tell me what you're working on, what you're working on next. And when are you expecting, is that something that we're working on? Uh, is that the next year, next two years? Like, what is that? What are you well, allowed I, to speak about that project? Or I, 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 I'm allowed to, and I, I wish I could speak about it more, but it's, it's just been on pause. Like we, we, we were scheduled to go to New Zealand to work with the Maori. Um, they have some amazing healing modalities down there. Uh, but that got paused, uh, right before sort of in March, um, right. As, as everything started going down and then, um, we've been trying to get down to Colombia for uh, a few times and it's gotten rescheduled. So we're, we're, we're just trying to finish um, the last few stops, but um, the goal with this project um, and it's sort of loosely tiled wisdom keepers, um, but um, the goal of it is to, is to explore these different traditions around the world of how they, how they heal mind, body, soul, how they work with these things and and, and some of them use plant medicines and some of them don't. In fact, most of them don't that we went to, um, but they all seem to have a, a similar thread that is much more mystical. It's much more, um, it's less physical. It's, it's on a different level of, of existence of being. And so um, that was the, the idea to understand what life is, what, what, what death is, what, what sickness is and disease and what healing is all about. Um, and, and to really find the similarities and the differences. And there's some amazing modalities and tools that to most of us in the West look completely ridiculous, but that have been used for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and uh, you can chalk it up to the placebo effect um, in some of these things, and that's fine, that's cool. Uh, because anything that's gonna induce the placebo effect, which is essentially the belief 
if you believe something that you're being healed and you can actually cause healing in yourself, right? Um, and the other one is the nocebo effect. So if you believe that something is not going to help you, you can actually block it from helping, you, right? So this idea of the placebo effect, which we just sort of dismiss in the Western world, which is hilarious to me. Um, it's the most is, consistent result in any- <laughs> Exactly. Result, yeah. Right, and we're like, oh, we got to throw it out, you know? And it's like, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so oh, this is no different than placebo. And it's like, well, why are we poo-pooing placebo? Placebo right. may be fantastic, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, you know, anything that can induce placebo is, is great in my opinion. So I don't pretend to, to really understand how it all works, but it is very interesting to, to notice the similarities in some of these traditions from that go back thousands of years from all over the world. And so that, that was really our goal and, and to experience and to show people uh, in the West primarily what goes on out there in the rest of the world um, that, that lives outside of, uh, you know, the, the world of pharmacy, the world of these drugs, you know, that, um, and, and there's a lot of cool stuff. And I think there's a lot of ways that we can, we don't need to adopt the, the modalities. You know, one example I'll refer to is egg healing. Uh, and this is a shamanic practice. They, they use an egg and they rub it all over your body and they do some prayer and they open it up and they can actually diagnose your ailments and, and then use prayer to, to, uh, to resolve whatever's going on. Now, we can believe that or not, that it's, it's irrelevant, but it's, it's been used for thousands of years and it continues to be used. And so um, I think it's interesting that it, that it at least allows us to hopefully to open up to these new ideas. Medical Qigong is another example of amazing stuff that happens with just energy. Um, how? Don't know. There's, 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 you, you can go down amazing rabbit holes to figure out how this is working. But I think to, to notice that it could work and to open up to that idea is probably the first part. If, if nothing else, then to, to just spark curiosity in some of these uh, traditions and some of these cultures, because they're doing something that is working comparatively. Right? We've got a lot of physical sickness. We've got a lot of spiritual sickness and um, emotional and mental challenges here in the West that we've created for ourselves. And so um, perhaps we need to humble ourselves if we want to get to the bottom of that. And I think opening up to some of these other cultures and other traditions as a way to um, to see a bigger world is important. Right. And if you're only, you know, if you're in a dark room and you're flat, you know, your flashlight is just on one aspect of the wall, you can only see one thing. So just sort of, I think this is a beautiful tie up to our conversation, because if you can just either change the direction of the flashlight to see a different aspect of the wall, maybe you can integrate the two a bit more, you know, a bit more seamlessly or a bit more uh, integratively. Or maybe you just flip on the light and you can see all the different, you can see all the different aspects that are available to you. And I think, you know, um, the allopathic, you know, there's, it's not that it's just garbage and we need to throw it out. Of course, like if you get hit by a truck, like don't, I want you to take me to the hospital and I want them to, I want them to help me there. I don't want to have someone breaking an egg and telling me what I, I want to be in a hospital. Exactly. Exactly. However, I think that there's, you know, what you're talking about is this energetic, there's, there's, there's these intangibles that we, it would be absolutely ludicrous for us to say that we, this categorically works and this categorically doesn't work because of my understanding, you know, and I mentioned before, like, I'm just a young Padawan. I, I may have passed judgment in that question. And I think the same is true in medicine. Like we can very quickly move to past judgment because we don't understand something. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, no, I, I totally agree. And, and then taking that, um, coming at it from, um, an infant's curiosity, right? Like yes. really coming at things, um, as a, from a place of wonder without judgment and without trying to shut it down, that curiosity, I think is really, really valuable. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I think these, these things that we are trying to understand, they, they're difficult from the lens and from the viewpoint in which we operate. These, we can cultivate the subtle awareness practices that are being used in some of these other traditions that can sense energy, that can feel energy, that can see energy. It's just, we've, we've doled our senses to that. And so, so to some degree, it takes practice to get into that subtle awareness. We've got to re remember how to see and feel and sense those energies. Um, because as we do that, then we can start to see a, a, a number of worlds open up to us. So I think that's, that's really the key. And, and um, you said something really important that, that I think is maybe the most important thing from a scientific perspective um, that we've talked about on this podcast. 
which is that we typically live in an or world. This works or that. No, it's not that, it's this. And we see this all the time in arguments. You're wrong and I'm right. It, it's, it's an either or. Well, if you really look at things, usually it's an and. This person's right and this person's right because the perspectives are different. That you, you, perhaps you've seen the, that, um, that object that's floating in a room and on one side, it's a circle. And then on the other side, it's a, it looks like a square. And then on the bottom, it looks like a triangle. And so depending on which perspective, you're seeing a blue, a blue circle or a green square or underneath a red triangle. And if you talk to any person in that, in that perspective, they're going to they're gonna be 100% sure that what they're looking at is a green cube, right? And the other person says, oh, no, I promise you it's a blue cylinder, right? So um, it depends on what perspective you're coming at. And so if we, if we just open up to this and reality, so this, is, this could be true and that could be true. Pharmaceutical drugs can be effective and herbalism can be effective and chiropractic can be effective and uh, osteopath, uh, osteopathy can be effective and acupuncture can be effective, right? So why are we choosing one or the other? I tried this and that didn't work, so I now I'm going to try that. Well, we can, we can take a, a multivariate approach to this and, and recognize that on one level of reality, something can be true and something can also be true. I can have pain in my knee and physical uh, uh, deformity in my knee. And I can explain that with biochemical changes that are happening uh, in the knee itself, right? In the structure of the knee. And I can perhaps explain that by trauma that has affected my nervous system, affected my fascia and, and affected uh, how my body utilizes calcium, vitamin D3, K2, et cetera, right? So I can explain these things on a number of different realities. And so it's not necessarily an either or, um, and I could also perhaps explain that on a spiritual level that I needed to go through that in order to propel me on a journey that would allow for my optimal spiritual growth in this lifetime. So there are so many things that I can uh, look at and different levels of reality to, to become aware of. And so it's, it's sometimes hard to suss out what's really true, um, but it, it also depends on which level of reality you're, you're focusing on and how, how much of an awareness you can really hold. Can you hold nine different truths at the same time? Are you capable of that uh, without passing judgment on, on any of them? Can you develop an integrated view of all these things? And as you cultivate that and develop that and practice that, and I kind of demonstrate that a little bit, that I have a judgment piece, right, that earlier on. And so that's, that's here. That's true. That's very real. So I can't deny that there's a piece of me that still wants to judge and criticize and, and do that. And I can also acknowledge that I'm now aware that I can actually see that, feel that, recognize that in myself and not let that. I don't have to identify with that. I don't have to let that control me, right? So there's multiple levels of reality that I can work with. And that allows me to navigate things in so much more of an elegant way and, and allows for more compassion, more understanding. Um, and, and again, that's a practice. That's something that, that deepens, that, that, that integrates, that stabilizes over time if I'm conscious, if I have that intention, if that's my practice. Well, let me just say that this has been a joy talking to you. Um, oh, it's been amazing. I love, I love this conversation. Thank you yeah, so much for having me on. Is, oh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. I'm so glad Ari, um, our mutual friend had connected me to you and I'm so glad that he did. And when your uh, documentary is ready, of course, I will absolutely support you and letting everyone know on the podcast where they can find it. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Dr. Stephen Gundry is the video that's coming up next for you. Just click right here. We're talking about the microbiome, energy, postbiotics, mitochondria, and how to get your energy back. Continuous ketosis, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year is really dumb. 